Good afternoon. My name is Tom Segru, and I'm the director of the Penn Social Science and Policy Forum. Welcome to all of you. Um, before I introduce this afternoon's uh, speaker, um, I want to highlight a couple of events that are coming up in the next few weeks. Two weeks from today, Matt, is that right? Uh, the 25th. 25th. On the 25th of April, we'll be having a workshop for one of our two postdoctoral fellows. Uh, Lorencio Sanguino, who will be talking about the origins of Mexican migration to the United States, with commentary by two distinguished scholars of immigration, Professor Jose Moya from Barnard College uh, and Professor Madeline Sue from the University of Texas. That will be at an unusual time, 2 p.m. on the 25th, rather than our normal lunch hour. I also want to invite you on May 2nd to a day-long conference that will cap the year uh, on immigration and metropolitan revitalization. We have an amazing lineup of sociologists, historians, geographers, uh, and others, uh, social scientists who are grappling with the spatial, uh, political, um, housing market, and the labor market impact of uh, immigration uh, to the United States. Um, it's going to be a very stimulating day. Uh, you can find information about those events and about upcoming social science and policy forum uh, events and opportunities uh, at our webpage. Uh, you can also friend us on Facebook, uh, where we regularly post um, upcoming events. I'm delighted to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Devesh Kapoor. He is the director of the Center for the Advanced Study of India here at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's also associate professor of political science. His research uh, is wide-ranging. It focuses on human capital, national and international public institutions, and the ways in which local global linkages, especially international migration and international institutions, affect political and economic change in developing countries, especially India. He's author of a number of different books and many articles, most recently, Diaspora, Democracy and Development, The Impact of International Migration from India on India, which was published in 2010 and won the Ethnicity, Nationalism and Migration section of the International Studies Association Distinguished Book Award. He's also written, uh, among others, Give Us Your Best and Brightest, The Global Hunt for Talent and Its Impact on the Developing World, Public Institutions in India, Performance and Design, and uh, an overview of the history of the World Bank, its first half century. So this afternoon, he'll be speaking on part of a new research project that he's engaged in on Indian Americans' life and work uh, of a new immigrant community. So no further ado, talk to the floor for you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so this uh, uh, project uh, is a part of a book project with colleagues Sanjay Chakravarti, who's a geographer at the temple, and Nirvikar Singh, who's an economist at UT, at UC Santa Cruz, and with a colleague here whose name is not mentioned, who's a PhD student, Sir Hapur Tijadav, who's really helped me put this together. Uh, <coughs> so uh, the, 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 the talk will really focus on a phenomenon which began sort of after 1965 when the Immigration <laughs> Reform Act, it, it, it again began to allow sort of Asians to come like, to, to India. And as some of you know, uh, the 1924 Act, uh, after that sort of Asian <laughs> migration to the US I had been banned. So what I'm going to do is uh, give you a sense of the, the characteristics of the Indian American population, a uh, sense of the comparison with other groups, uh, sort of look at patterns of assimilation, and particularly their political behavior, and sort of ask this question, uh, what explains what might be called a certain degree of hey, exceptionalism? And what I want to focus there is the very selection with characteristics of these migrants and how they've shaped, how they've done here. So our, our data is from the US Census, the American Community Survey, uh, uh, surveys like from Pew, uh, then surveys which we have done for ourselves, both in the US and here. 
and the survey of business owners. That's also done by the US census. So here's a sort of thing of the Indian American population. Uh, uh, you can see that it was barely a few thousand till 1920. Uh, <coughs> and, and really, 1960, prior like, to the Immigration Act, uh, the total number of, of, in, of people who were born in India and staying here was barely 12,000. And then you begin to see a very rapid increase. This is a sort of log scale, so it's, this is not you know, linear. And you see an increase from 50,000 and f half a million, one million, and then 2.8 like million. Two thirds of this population has come oh, over the last 20 years. So it's really a very rapid increase. It's an interesting thing when you look at the census, how Indians have been, you know, how the census has, has sort of marked this group. They were classified as part of some other race or white. Then they were classified as Hindu, even though many were not Hindu. Uh, they were actually Sikh and sort of Muslim. Uh, then there was a catch-all category called other race. Then they moved to white, and now it's settled on Asian Indian. And it's an interesting, I mean, there's a whole sort of history on that, which I won't to get into now, which sort of shows the changing sort of attitudes. Uh, now, one big difference, of course, is that the further you, you the country, the further the, the distance like from the US, the likelihood that the person is a legal migrant sort of increases. So uh, a far greater fraction of Asian migrants like the US are, are sort of legal relative to Hispanic and you know, migrants. It's much harder to come here. Uh, and by sorry, by uh, 2010, like 11, uh, so Indians have had become the second like, largest group of legal migrants, uh, so replacing the Philippines, which used to be the second largest, and of course the largest is from Mexico. So it's a huge change from very trivial like numbers going back barely four decades ago. Uh, you see the shift in migration in the destinations, uh, uh, 80s to 90s it was the East Coast and the West Coast, and then the Chicago area, Texas and like New York. And now you see sort sort of new states like Arizona and so Washington have become uh, uh, larger states of, of some migration. Uh, the, a, there are some issues with the US census because they, they, so you can you know, define Asian Indian either by ancestry or by race. And these two are very different numbers. Uh, you'll always find that by race, the numbers are sort of much higher than those by ancestry. And there's a whole big reason why that's the case. Our analysis <coughs> is based on numbers by race. Uh, so if you have any questions, I can just sort of answer that. Uh, now, so about 60% of the Indian American pop population was born in, 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 in so India, 30% here, and another 10% have been born so all over the world. So for instance, an interesting group is the one in South America and the C C Caribbean. These were uh, so indentured you know, labors that were taken there in the late 19th century. And uh, like for instance, a very big group here is from Guyana. And after the US you know, sponsored coup, coup there in the 1950s, which toppled the, the left wing, so sort of Indian origin president. So many Indian uh, people of Indian origin from Guyana began to settle here and in Canada. Uh, <coughs> But really, the, by far the dominant group is born in India. Uh, much of our analysis, which I'm going to show, is focused on this group because this group is still very young. So when you look at things like earnings, education, all of that, you, we confine our analysis to those above the age of 
to 25. And this population is largely below the age of 25 still. A very small fraction, barely 10%, is, is above the age of 25. So this will change, of course, very rapidly in the next you know, decade. But, but if you want to look at broader earnings, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's this group that really comprises the large majority. Uh, if, you, if you want to see where they're coming from in India, one way to see is the, is the language sort of spoken. And broadly, what you have is roughly about a third are coming from South India. That's uh, Telugu is now the, the largest South Indian, then Tamil and Malayalam. Uh, and a little bit of Kannada, which is this language. And these are the four South Indian. Uh, North Indian is Hindi and Punjabi. West Indian is Gujarati. Very, very little from East India, uh, uh, especially like from Bengal, uh, which is a bit surprising, but uh, you know you see this very stark. <coughs> now, what we're going to do is to just give you a sense of comparisons with other groups, uh, especially with Asian groups, uh, other Asian immigrants. And with, uh, uh, and with, this is a sort of group that is you know, defined, very clearly defined within the census, which is uh, non-Hispanic whites. Uh, one thing is that the Indian American population is, is much younger. If you look at the median age, uh, and if you look at uh, the 100 to 25 age, it's uh, the share. So this one uh, is is those born in India. So these are all the foreign born, those born in Japan, Philippines, Taiwan, China, and India. So since most immigrants come like, to the US for education or on H-1B visas, uh, their share of under 25 is, is, is a very small. Now what that means is that these households most of the members of the households are in the working age. And that, I, I'll show you, it plays an important role why their incomes, like relatively, are much higher, because more members of the household work. Uh, uh, very stark thing, they are, large, they are the highest fraction of dual parents to the household. And this partly reflects the social conservativeness of Indian society, that marriage is still very strong both in India as well as in immigrants here. Uh, that's why you see that the female share of household is the lowest. This is roughly a mirror image, this one, of, of this, right? Uh, so education, uh, when you look at education, the group that most compares with Indian Americans is actually not Chinese as a whole, but the Chinese from the Taiwan. Uh, <coughs> so this is the thing that really stands out, right? That about 40% plus. These are, uh, this is the racial grouping within the census. This is blacks, whites. This is all foreign born. Uh, this is China, Taiwan, and those born in sort of, India. Uh, <coughs> and you see the same uh, when it comes to college plus postgraduate, the share is uh, even higher. Right? It's really hugely different from the average sort of, American non-Hispanic white. Uh, and the you know, closest group <coughs> are people from the Taiwan. Uh, <coughs> So of course, we know that, that in the US, so education is a very good predictor of so income. And uh, it's not surprising that both in median family income and per capita income, uh, uh, so Indians and Taiwanese have the highest of all immigrant groups, and much higher than the average sort of US incomes. Now, one, one reason why this is the case is the occupations in which they are. And that's partly, and I'll show you this also a bit like later, 
it's not just the level of education, but the type of education that, make, that is making a big, big difference. So they are much more likely to be in, uh, in what are called STEM, which is science, the technology, and engineering, you know, broadly defined. Which means that the occupations which they are in, uh, uh, which is especially this business science, uh, they, have a, they have a much higher share. So a much larger fraction of this population is in these occupations. Now one thing which we are looking at, and this my colleague Tim Ricard is looking at most, is what we are looking at is this large sort of entrepreneurship puzzle. Uh, what we find is when we're looking at the census data uh, that in Indian American businesses earn more on average than all other entrepreneurial groups. Uh, their sales are also much higher than sales of firms established by other Asian immigrant groups. Now this is a puzzle that is particularly great if one knows about the social composition of these migrants. These migrants really came from what are called the professional middle class in India. And as a group that group by and large, though not everyone, uh, these social groups were very wary of entrepreneurship. Uh, and entrepreneurship was actually you know, frowned upon. It wasn't something you actually did. You got a good job, and that was what was the highest sort of aspiration. Uh, but what we find is that group that, that same social group has now become very su successful sort of entrepreneurs. And the question is why, right? How did this transformation take place? Uh, now you can say, well, because the, the conditions for entrepreneurship sort of in the United States are much more favorable relative to that I in India. So that being true, but then that should be true of all immigrant groups, not just like for this immigrant group. Uh, one thing we've just we've been doing these surveys of these of these Indian business owners to, to get a sense of their backgrounds. Uh, this is just to just uh, take to show you that uh, if you look at sort of Indian <coughs> firms, so if you look at firms by size by different ethnic groups, if you go to the the firms which are the largest or, or, or the highest sales, you see that the green is, is the Indian is sort of business owners. And they have a much higher share of firms which have half a million dollars on or more in sales, right? So they are much more, you know, skewed like to the right. Uh, this is the sorts of sectors in which they are in, and there are big differences between those who were immigrants and those who were not in, in, in immigrants. And and non-immigrants are particularly high in so-called professional services, uh, which is that you, that you run in a hospital, uh, things like that. Uh, what I think we are sort of arguing is that one of the reasons that this group has been successful in entrepreneurship is their attitude towards uncertainty. So for an entrepreneur, the ability to take risk and manage uncertainty is, is, uh, is obviously very sort of important. And we find that, uh, that many of these entrepreneurs, while they came from middle class families, but as children, they moved around a, a lot like within India. Uh, in fact, a, a, a larger number than we anticipated came from backgrounds whose parents were in the federal government in, in India. And if you are in the federal government in India, your father was in the army, you have to move hey, every few years. And you have to actually move to very different sort of environments because the, et the ethnic hey, environments are very different when you move sort of across states. So in particular, you find that they move uh, across Indian states. When we look at Indian migration or internal Indian migration, it's barely uh, 3 to 4 per per percent when, you, when we look at interstate migration. This group has had, you know, growing up, a uh, much larger fraction of them have moved as, as children. And one of the things which we are looking at is whether that in turn has meant that their ability to handle sort of uncertainty ha ha has been you know, greater, precisely because that's what was the, was the environment 
which you know shape them. Uh, the other thing we find is that because their backgrounds are hard in STEM, uh, you find that a very large like number of them have, and that's the you know classic you know Silicon Valley story, and they are in sectors which are the more you know rapid growth sectors. So if you the sales of your firms will grow much faster if the sector in which the firm is operating is itself growing much, much faster. And that's one big reason, though that's not the only big reason why we think that this is you know, happening. The other thing, and this uh, is very much in contrast to Chinese who have much the same education you know, levels and science backgrounds is the felicity with English, right? This is like from Pew's sort of Asian American survey. And this is, speaks English less than very well. About half of Chinese are immigrants. That's the case. And it's about one fourth in the case of Indians. And we know that you succeed in some labor markets here. Uh, so there's a fair bit of work on Korean Americans who particularly came in the 60s and 70s who were trained in engineering and science, but their uh, uh, lack of skills in English often led them to, to start sort of small businesses, like especially you know, you know, these, these are laundromats, which is a classic Korean ethnic you know, business. But it was nothing to do with their skills per se, but it was the language. And this is because of India's colonial sort of heritage, but also because I'll show you you know, who leaves India, that their skills with English are relatively much, much greater, which of course makes a big difference in some labor markets. Uh, now, for assimilation, uh, for one thing which stands out is if you look at intermarriage rates, you see that Indians are by far, the, these are lowest. And this reflects that thing about like marriage. It's a socially still conservative group in some relative terms. Uh, and you see it's very high with Japanese, and it's by far the lowest. Uh, if you look at Filipino, Korean, Chinese, Vietnamese, and, and Indian. Uh, so on, on this particular indicator of assimilation, it's still very, very low. Uh, if, if you look at uh, sort of income uh, and earnings, uh, what I think is, so the usual story is that when immigrants come like, to the US, and this is the classic story, especially the early part of the 20th century, their average incomes are much lower than the average income of a US born like, resident. And then it's what we call a sort of regression like, to the mean, that over the next two generations, you gradually rise up from and you, know, you see that you see this mobility and it's both spatial you come to the inner city and move out to the suburb but you also change your occupation your father was a policeman or fireman a very blue collar type job and you gradually <laughs> move up and that was true of the Irish Americans of the Italian Americans those were the you know, you know stories here what is different is and we'll, we'll show you some stuff that Sanjoy, who just joined us, has done on, on the spatial, is that Indians, in a sense, move directly to these suburbs. And the regression to the mean, which was the usual story, is going up to the median. In this case, the regression to the mean can only mean going down, because they start off much above. And the question is, does assimilation actually mean not moving up, but the simulation actually means moving down. And that's a very different type of story than the usual sort of, sort of immigration story. Uh, so here's the thing that if, if we compare the ratio of incomes of the Indian born to non-Hispanic whites, uh, what we find is that if they are less educated, there is a income penalty. And it's very likely that if you are less educated, your English language skills are also very low. So to succeed in labor markets is harder. But surprisingly, if you have a graduate degree, you actually have a premium. Now mind you, these are Indian bonds. So it means that 
as soon as you come and you hit the labor market, you already are above the average, right? Even when you compare for the level of education. And this, again, I think, is because of the types of education that they have, not just the level, because we are controlling it for that. And this premium actually rises sharply when we look at household income. And that has to do with the fact that far more Indian households are, are, are uh, far less Indian households are single parent, right? So that conservative social structure actually means that even in high school or less or some college, the Indian born in each of these groups has a premium over the non-Hispanic white, I mean non-Hispanic whites, so, so those who are US born, right? Which is actually, which is something we did not expect, at least here, but when you look at the composition of, of households, it begins to make like, more sense. Uh, as you would expect, the, you might expect that this uh, uh, premium increases the longer you stay in the US. You have social networks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it doesn't, it seems to be fairly constant uh, after a decade. So it, you already come, you know, pretty high up very soon. You have a premium. It rises somewhat, but not hugely. Uh, now, the one feature and uh, people ask is, to what extent are these higher incomes because of, of <laughs> very late, right? Now, of course, the causality runs both ways. You might live in a rich like neighborhood or a particular neighborhood because you're wealthy, or because you live in those type of like, like neighborhoods, it has a wealth sort of effect. Uh, so one of the things is that, that Indians are very spatially clustered. So about, about two thirds of Indians live in 100 counties out of the 3,200 counties. So it's a fairly concentrated, spatial concentration. But they are far less concentrated than, than other Asian groups. So this is the Indian figure. Bangladeshis are very concentrated. I think just in some New York, in Brooklyn, you have a significant fraction of the Bangladeshi population. You can see that the top 25 counties uh, two thirds of Bangladeshis live in just 25, which is less than 1% of all the counties in the US. So while Indians are clustered, like almost all groups, they are relatively less clustered than other sort of Asian groups. Uh, uh, what, what we find is that four fifths of the population lives in counties that have a median household income, at least one standard deviation, so above the mean. Uh, but what you also find very interestingly is where the poorest Indians live. And interestingly enough, when many of them live, the poorest Indians live uh, almost within handshaking distance of where the richest Indians live, which is California, uh, which is basically the, the Bay Area, you know, largely, and this part of the California, which is agricultural, like labor from India, which works in the farms. Uh, and is largely from the Punjab and Sikh. Uh, whereas in the New York area, which I'll just show you, uh, it's, the, it's those who, who, who live in Queens, uh, and they live like next to those, to the richest sort of zip codes, you know, like New Rochelle, etc. cetera. Uh, and you see this is a, a, a sort of New York map, and this is where the, the sort of poorest Indians live, uh, uh, which is a part of, of Sir Queens. Uh, so you see also spatial clustering by, of course, income, which is, which is hardly surprising. Uh, now what we find is that when we control for all of these things which we say like matter for income, the, the education, matter status, years in the school, you know, what type of education you got, your occupation, et cetera, et cetera. We still find something that you cannot explain, which is uh, uh, there still is a premium, 
And one of the things in this, of course, in all migration work is, which I'll show you next, is what we, what we measure and show that there are selection effects are always on observable characteristics, whether it's race or gender, where you live, uh, your occupation, your education, etc., etc. What you can't get is non-observables, right? Are immigrants, in a sense, uh, as the saying goes, do they have more fire in the belly, in a sense? Are they more ambitious? Are those the guys who left precisely because they were more so ambitious, right? That is much harder to get because, of course, you can only observe certain outcomes. You can't observe that sort of independently. Now, if you look at the political behavior of this group, right, you can think of it in, in how they vote. Uh, these are the sorts of ways that we are even looking at their political behavior in uh, campaign finance because they're wealthy to, 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 to do the right, like more checks. Uh, do they stand like for elections? Uh, are they working more in the executive branch, etc.? And also the, the the activism part. And if you look at the political affiliation, this was again from Pew. Uh, you see that Indians were the most likely group after African Americans, I'll show you, who are the most democrat social group sort of in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is when you compare US and non-US citizens of Indian and Chinese origin. And as you can see, when there's a lot of non-citizens, many more are independents. Uh, they still haven't made up mind. It doesn't really matter sort of as much. Now, the puzzle is this. If you look at, uh, this is again from Pew, right? That as incomes sort of increase as you go down, the support like for Republicans increases. It's a well-known thing that, that poorer Americans relatively vote for Democrats. Richer Americans relatively uh, uh, vote more, more, more like Republicans. If you look at the Indian puzzle, there's no difference, right? There's absolutely no difference. Uh, and it is, uh, now we have some speculation which I'll share with you, but we don't have a very good answer <laughs> as yet. Uh, so as I said, we are possibly the most uh, democratic leaning group after African Americans. Uh, because, but however, because they are concentrated in states that are already Democrat leaning, which is in the East Coast and the West Coast, uh, their voting influence is very limited. So their numbers are limited like, to begin with. Uh, and in the US, you know, if you're a swing state and you're a swing like, voter, you will have relatively more influence. And of course, Cuban Americans in Florida are, a, are this prototype immigrant group that plays that role. Uh, now, but what I sort of said is when we look at why they are so overwhelmingly Democrat, despite the, uh, their much higher incomes, you would expect it to be different based on incomes. And we think that the answer is you know, religion. And that there is a strong discomfort with the Christian right being part of the Republican Party since the vast majority of, of Indians are who are here, and I'll show you this, some of the data, they are Hindu. So the message of the Christian right, so the, while the economic message is something that resonates with a lot, the social message of the Republicans is very, uh, 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 we don't have survey data to show that is the, the reason. But as we eliminated all other possibilities, uh, this is so. If you look at the two most prominent Indian Americans in American politics, the two governors, uh, Bobby Jindal in, in Louisiana and Nikki Haley in South Carolina, it's not surprising that could, they could only become that because they converted to Christianity. And I think that is symbolic of this uncomfortable fact of the role of like religion in political life. Uh, we just are uh, still at the stage of gathering data on these, so it'll still take us a few months on this. Uh, 
But this is the sort of, and I'll end with this, an explanation why you have this uh, you know, behavior, this sort of exceptionalism. And, and I think it can be sort of, sort of expressed in just one word, which is selection. Uh, and I'll show you that this group is, is exceptional in the human capital, that's all I mean by selection, is relative both to the population which they're moving away from, which is India, as well as the population they're moving into, which is the US. Uh, so if you, if you think of who leaves, who has left India, right? You know, migration like from India, which goes back to the mid 19th century. Actually, if you want, it goes back like to the Roma, like moving from India in the late 10th, 11th century, like to Europe, but that's a different group. So what we find is that over time, uh, from the mid 19th century to now, uh, the, the selection bias has increased in that, in particular, as sort of that the, in more like recent years relative to earlier years, the migration stream is much more upper caste and is much more highly educated relative to those who left the indentured labor and those going to the Middle East and those who went to uh, UK and East Africa in the 50s and 60s. Uh, this is a survey which I had done of 200,000 households in India. So this is the most elite group. This is a socioeconomic classification, uh, which is based on income, education, and, and, and occupation. And you find that this group you shared is less than 3%. In India, 35% of all migrants from India come from this group. R4, which is the poorest rural Indians, which were one third of all this entire population in India, barely 1% migrates here. Right? Very different, I would argue, from the migration like from Mexico to the US. Right? So you see, right there you see, uh, if we look at immigration rates by levels of education, you see that if you look at 2000, if you have primary education, the rate is 0.1%. Uh, if you have tertiary education, it's 4.2%. It's 42 times larger, right? Uh, the more educated you are relative to if you are not at all educated. If we look at by religion, right, you see that more than half of Muslims go to the Middle East and more than <coughs> half the Christians go to the Middle East. And that's largely migration from Kerala, which is a, which is a state which has a large Christian population and, and, and some nurses from Kerala have been going a lot to the Middle East. Whereas, whereas migration to the US, the, that's the dominant place for, for Hindu migrants. Uh, <coughs> if you look at the caste, right, uh, that about 70% of all the Indian American population is, is upper caste. And the share of the Indian population would be about 16, 17 percent, right? So it's it's again very heavily coming from the stream, and it's not surprising because since the Immigration Act, what it did was the barrier to entry was based legal immigration for a long time was by skill or education, and the upper caste had uh, the the hegemony over higher education in India for the better part of the 20th century. So they were best equipped to take such advantage of, of this. And once you have that, then of course you have family migration and all of those other things and the social you know, networks. It's also the case that the changing, neighbor, changing nature of politics within India, where the upper caste began to lose their power in India, made moving out of India far more attractive. Now, if you see the selection effects now, right, the, the now you can begin to see, right? Uh, this is, uh, if you look at college degree and graduate degree, comparing Indian born, China born to non-Hispanic whites. This is again back like the US like data, right? And you see college and graduate degree of Indians compared to uh, 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 the, the, the non-Hispanic, the, the, the white population of the US, right? Huge changes. Uh, 
what is interesting is that this advantage persists in the second generation. Uh, in fact, the second generation uh, college degree or a graduate degree is more than like 90% of the population. Right. So what we are seeing is not the usual story of convergence in the second generation. It might happen a third or fourth, but actually further divergence. So the, the usual assimilation story is some story, depending on how you take it, of, of convergence. But this story with this like data which we have seems to indicate that it might be the, 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 the sort of opposite. Uh, and I think uh, here's the sort of selection story in a, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, if you focus here, right? So this is the Indian born sort of in the US. So those who were born sort of in India, but living in the US, uh, 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 those who have a college degree, and that's about three fourths of the population. This is the population in India that has a college degree and that has, is about 8%, right? So it's from this group <coughs> that you're selecting the, this group, right? Uh, this is the people with college degree sort of in the US <coughs> itself. So this group is moving into this group, right? Uh, and that's why you see that it is selective, not just from the population. It is highly selective from the population it is moving from and relatively selective uh, in the, in, compared to the population that it is moving sort of into. Uh, and it's not just the level, but as I said, if you looked at uh, uh, the science and engineering related degrees, uh, which is STEM and STEM like related, you see that relative to non-Hispanic whites, it's a much larger share, right? And again, it's a selection story. Uh, if you look at it sorry, uh, in, uh, in this field, which is computer science, engineering, and the occupational structure of US workers, the Indian born, it's almost a third, right? Uh, and this is the native born, which is 4.4%, right? And that's, of course, the, the sectors that have the highest growth, the highest income growth, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's again, it's almost sort of eight times the, the, the sort of ratio. Uh, and I think this is the final slide. That the reason you have this hey, exceptionalism and why the, because we're really comparing two very distributions, right? This is, if this, so on average, the human capital in the US is higher than the average human capital of the Indian population, meaning those within India. Oh, sorry. Uh, but what we have is, from the Indian population, we are drawing from this particular tail end of this distribution, and that tail end, the average of that tail end is of course going to be higher than the average of the US population, and that's what is really driving this, 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 this phenomenon. Thank you. Well, we have ample time for questions, so would you like to sure. field questions? Great. So uh, please uh, jump in for questions. I was wondering, Devesh, if you could say something about like how does this compare to Pakistan? Uh, the 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 relative size of the Pakistani population in the U.S. is considerably less. It's about one-sixth. So it's about the ratio of the populations of the two countries. In terms of, of all conventional indicators, which is education, income, it's relatively much less. Yeah. Yes? I would propose that for most Americans and India is one country. India is like Europe. Europe is called a continent. India, so many language groups, I don't know how many, but I'm sure there's a minimum of something like 
40 to 50 that are spoken by a considerable number of people. Some Indians are Muslims. Some Indians are uh, Hindus. Most Indians are Hindus. Some Indians are Christians. Then you have these language groups. And they're not necessarily congruent with a particular state, because India is divided into states. What I'm trying to talk about is how difficult it would be for Americans to grasp the complexity of Indian society. And additionally, certain things that exist in India exist in both Bangladesh and Pakistan. And uh, there's also caste difference, which is something that is quite a different experience than a class difference. And there could be class difference as well as caste difference. So, my ultimate point is how very complex this society is to try to introduce it or explain it to a group of people that aren't particularly interested at, to some level in what people do in other countries because in the United States it's a big country and most big countries don't really care. They talked about that the other day in another class. Chinese, Russians, and the United States have three of the four largest countries in the world. They really don't give much of a darn about what goes on in other societies. And when India is like a middle-sized country, but it's intensely, densely populated, it's sort of like it's there, but, and I'm not putting anything down in India. I don't mean it that way. I'm just saying how, with all the things that are in the world to consider, the complexity of your culture, your country, is very, very difficult to grasp. I'm struggling with some of the stuff up there, and I try to learn about it. That's an observation I'd like to make. I, you know, one of the things, uh, I lived in the uh, UK for a while, and so the research done was also that the social networks of the Indians also were one of the main reasons of the success. Um, well, from the sorts of, of data we have at least looked at, like right now, uh, you can't get, you know, the U.S. Census doesn't really uh, allow you to, to get those. Uh, the, uh, you know, I think that requires, which we are also doing, a different type of work when you talk to entrepreneurs. Uh, how did they raise their the initial round of you know, funding? Was it from financial institutions or from their social networks? And that's where you begin to see these things really begin to you know matter. Because I, um, my husband is professional. He came as a student and he worked on here courses for higher education. They have a lot of family and friends in India. So I come from East India, West India, East India. So West India. And we have enough extended family who is working in businesses and entrepreneurship. And it's been fascinating how quickly they can um, rise and work hard and make uh, you know, income, high level income. Well, that's the one group you know, which is about you near know, 15%, which stands out. So we know, for instance, that something like 40% of all motels mm -hmm. in the U.S. are owned by this small group. Uh, they've been particularly important. We're looking at, we're beginning to look at data on franchises. And for some reason, if you, I'm sure if you go to 30th Street Station and you see the, all the Dunkin' Donuts franchises, and you'll see like what I mean, uh, Subway, Dunkin' Donuts, it's extraordinary the degree of ownership of these franchises by this particular group because it requires savings, but it does, doesn't require exceptional skills. So you see that the relatively lower educated Indian immigrants, their entrepreneurship paths are very different from the entrepreneurship paths of those in New York or Silicon Valley. But this is a very large group. And it's it's a it's a it's a very wealthy group. 
the political preferences of this group in the U.S. Uh, do you see that changing, or do you see that fairly constant? Because both Democrats and Republicans have sort of the foreign policy aspect of it, or immigration, or outsourcing companies. They're only starting to flesh out the differences between those two policies. So do you think that those issues will become more pertinent to the American Indian society going forward, or you would expect more dem more support to Democrats going forward regardless? Uh. I think uh, there is relatively more constancy in foreign policy towards India than one might think. It changes somewhat, but not that large enough to really shift in the voting preferences. And it's not clear at all that voting preferences are based on foreign policy attitudes towards India, as opposed to the overwhelming dominance of domestic concerns which is true of all Americans, right? Generally, it is the domestic concerns that drive voting behavior. Uh, you know, it's only in very exceptional cases that foreign policy or security becomes that important as to shape voting behavior. So I think my own sense is that, uh, uh, you know, if we look at surveys going back, it's remarkably constant. It's remarkably constant. The the degree of support for the Democratic but, Party. But because it's an immigrant population, then they, uh, shouldn't it be that they are more concerned than the average American on the foreign policy, specifically with the country that they come from? Yeah, relatively like to that. Uh, but uh, it doesn't see, at least we have no evidence to say that it matters uh, you know, in any strong way. I mean, I think the Republican attitude towards immigration coupled with religion, uh, undoubtedly also adds to this apprehension. Can I have a joke for this when George Bush was at its lowest popularity in the US, he had the highest popularity in India. Yeah. And the same is true for Obama. Yeah. Like the same thing happens in India. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to understand the relationship between the Indian population and the American population. Yeah. 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 Yeah.